Yeah! Never mad at the fact he's corrupt like a senator. Morning, how are you? Got a pull for him. I guess I guess that's our clue to get going. All right. That was nice. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to Forex Dot Today, the YouTube community of more than 20,000 foreign exchange traders. We gather here today to conduct technical and fundamental analysis with the overriding goal of planning our trades in advance because well, trading is risky not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. But please stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, never risk money you cannot afford to lose. Hey, check it out. Today's the first day of the Masters. Huh? I haven't got the shirt. Nice! Ooh, yeah, right? Ooh. I, I don't know if I can stand up and point at the same time. No, I got to do the other hand. Oh. <laughs> Anywho, first day of the Masters. It's a big thing here in Georgia. And I went uh, 2022. Isn't that neat? Yeah, and I got the ball marker, which is nice. Uh, yeah, sweet. Sweet. Master, master. And it's never going to focus. Oh, yeah. Cool. Anywho. Nice. JP went 2004. Cool. It's amazing when you go to like grab a sandwich and they're like, it's $2. And you're like, what? <laughs> they had good sandwiches too. It's pretty good. The pimento cheese, right? Anywho, uh, so look, we got a big day and it's getting uh, ready to go. The interest rate decision by the ECB in about uh, eight and a half minutes. Then we'll zip it around, zippity doo dah around our charts and around our tools, and then we'll come back for the press conference. Okay. Nice. Does sound like a decent day? I think so. Cool. So let's get going since we're not far from the event. If you want to watch the live stream on a web page instead of through this, you can do it there. So some of the tools, oops, 
I didn't want to do that. Let's go. I want to organize this. First of all, the I started FX Boot Camp 20 years ago. I guess I should bring that up. It's now a por uh, portfolio, sorry, uh, uh, a performance coaching platform. And we got some new things coming for this that are going to take it to even another extraordinary level. But what you probably know FX Boot Camp as about a year, year and a half ago became Investor Boot Camp because I also wanted to talk about gold and oil and stocks and stock indices. And I want to talk about portfolio construction and all that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, we already had expanded into monetary policy and central banking, and there's an oil trading course and uh, macroeconomics. And, you know, anyways, uh, there's a lot of other things I want to add to this. Um, personal finance, real estate, hedge fund strategies, all that is coming uh, soon, maybe even this summer. Maybe we'll do a summer school on something. Uh, I don't know what you want to do, real estate or hedge funds or whatever. Um, but we could certainly do that. And this is the, the, the primary value proposition, if you will, of Investor Bootcamp is that we have 100 hours of training videos. And for a little bit more money, you can join some of our live groups. We have two live groups, day trading and swing trading. So you can, get some, you can learn how to trade. Then as you grow a little stronger, okay, a little more skilled, you can move over to Quantbox or add Quantbox, which is artificial intelligence that automates the process of doing fundamental analysis. So it's the next layer above, right? So you can do quantitative analysis. It automates it. Things that used to take hours now take seconds, which is just absolutely phenomenal. Like you will you will be amazed like at this tool. This tool would have saved you a ton of money over the last five weeks. Cool. Then you want to add tradars. It's the next level up. It's value proposition is it automates the process of doing technical analysis. It's looking at 7,500 charts and telling you like the, the 10 or 15 that, that you should be focused on. And all the other ones are not worth your time. And it tells you why you might be interested. So let's just take a close look at one because I'm going to log into this later today. And it'll just say, hey, look at, South African Rand, check it out, 42 minutes ago. Go check it out. Go check it out. Go check it out. Go check it out. It doesn't make a decision for you. It's just like, hey, boss, did you notice this rising wedge breaking? You should go check that out. Well, what about pound yen? That was about an hour ago. Hey, boss, go open your 30-minute chart and go check that out. See? It helps you focus. But here's the problem. If you don't know how to trade, you need to start here. Just because this helps you focus doesn't mean it's going to do the decision-making process for you. Okay, If you suck at trading, you're still going to suck at trading even if you have good tools. So you, you definitely want to learn how to trade. So you understand the basics like price action and all that kind of stuff. And then get your fundamentals on and then use these tools in conjunction so you have a technical analyst working for you, a fundamental analyst working for you, and you know how to make the big boy decisions. This will probably make you a better trader. I don't know. Um, but your skill set is probably going to go up. And I would recommend that you uh, switch over to a broker that has an ECN model. It's just better for you. It's more. It's a symbiotic relationship. Um, they would love for you to succeed, for example. So you should use an ECN for sure. There are many ECNs. There's not tons, but there are are options out there in the world. So get off of a B, your broker's probably B booking you. So get off of a model like that and then use a model, uh, uh, find a, a broker with uh, ECN model of doing business. And I recommend you check out Trader's Way. I recommend that. Okay. So anyways, that is that. And we are now about 
two and a half minutes away from the actual result. Does Tradars even care? So you go to Tradars and check out the sonar. And uh, it doesn't even care. Did you know that? It's more worried about PPI coming out in 15 minutes at 8.30. It doesn't care about the ECB interest rate decision. Why? Is it mean? Is it mad at the ECB? Why does it not care? Remember, it's only doing technical analysis. So we care as fundamentalists, but technically it doesn't care. It doesn't care because there's no discernible pattern. If they cut, if they don't cut, if they, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, if they raise, um, there's no discernible pattern. So no matter what, even if it's a shocker and something happens, having looked at dozens of these events, there's no discernible pattern. Eh, it might go up, it might go down. So it says ignore it. But the news to use is PPI today. And there is there are discernible patterns on seven asset uh, uh, currency pairs. Less than expected, greater than expected, and that's it. Okay? It ignored a whole, if it comes out as expected. Well, there's no, if it comes out as expected, there's no discernible pattern. Okay? And here's the, here's the probabilities and all that kind of stuff. Here's the direction. Okay. What do you want to trade for PPI? Are you going to do Euro dollar? Well, if it comes out less than expected, don't trade Euro dollar. There's not a discernible pattern. You see how beautiful this is? But if it comes out greater than expected, you do want to trade the, the Euro dollar, but only swing trading. But it comes out less than expen uh, expected. If you're going to scalp, scalp the Aussie dollar. If you're going to scalp, scalp the Kiwi dollar. Don't scalp the pound dollar. Swing the pound dollar. You see how wonderful this is? So maybe we'll get an Aussie dollar scalp today, huh? Cool. Cool. And remember, the way that it does these calculations, by the way, is through actual analysis of the past. See? 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 Is it going to do that again? We don't know. Past performance does not predict future results. But it's better than being blind, boy. Okay? You might play a mean game of pinball, but you need an edge in trading. So, did the news come out? What did the ECB decide, huh? ECB has decided 4.5. They didn't do anything. Okay. So they are going to explain to us why they didn't do anything. <laughs> They're going to talk about it for a half an hour, why they didn't do anything. It's so funny, right? Okay, so as expected, and uh, well, we can very quickly go look at, uh, let's do just dollar pairs, right? Oh, well. I don't usually use this dollar pair, but let's do it. Um, let's go look at it over the last 15 minutes. See, the issue here is that the ECB has low inflation. I put this in my email that went out. The, the ECB has low inflation, 2.4. So very significantly lower inflation than the United States. And at the same time, the economy is slowing. So they could have cut. Maybe they cut soon. Maybe they're a June, 
right? They're a go for a June. Who knows? But in this case, it looks like the pause is bad news because if the ECB is going to let Europe go into a recession, then uh, maybe that's not good, right? Maybe cutting would have accelerated this. But whatever. Dollar's strong, bro. And that's that. That's the, the law of the land. We can look around and in uh, in a, a few minutes. Is it 8.30? Well, 8.30 we have the news come out. Um, the press conference is in, uh, twen uh, in a half an hour. So 8.45. All right, cool. So that's good. We, ha we have time to look at uh, the PPI number. Okay. And we're very sensitive to inflation right now. Start with the stock market. It fell yesterday. I want to review something you should know, but I don't know if you know or not. But non-farm payrolls I've done every single month for 18 years in a row. Friday was the 18th year. I've done the same event. every month for 18 years. Now, pretty soon, I'm going to become consistent and reliable. I'm almost there. And in that event, for years and years and years, I've taught what is known as a high volatility event-driven strategy. What does that mean? I can't predict the direction of the news because I don't know what the news is going to be in advance. You can do some guessing and all that kind of stuff for sure. Um, but I don't like to do that. I don't like to guess. Okay. So how do you handle a situation like CPI is red hot? Now, I did send an email an hour and a half in advance saying that I think inflation is going to come out hot, higher than expected. And I explained why. And then you guys logged in yesterday. And then in the first 30 minutes before the news came out, I pulled up the EIA governmental website and I showed you month over or week over week over week changes in gasoline prices, which is a major input into the CPI. And I uh, explained why I felt that way. And then uh, boom. There you go. Well, you're welcome. Hey, Davey. Yeah, good to see you. So then we come back to here. How do you handle it? Well, you could front run it and trade it before the news comes out, but I don't recommend that. Okay, I don't recommend that. That's guessing. And that's gambling. I don't do that. So what I've taught at these non-farm payrolls at FX Street over 18 years of high volatility of events is that you measure the vol, and I'm trying to zoom in. Okay, you gotta measure the vol, where is it? Oh, come on MT4, now where did you go? Where is the stupid thing, right? Can I? just gone uh, it's just gone where did it go come on Bubba where is the stupid news there we go okay thank you MT4 all right so step one okay there's the five minute candle so I'd call that peak peak to Valley News. Okay. You can also wait till it hesitates, right? It finds support and comes back. Doesn't really matter to me. Okay. All right. So that's that. That's what I've been teaching forever. 
And what I've been teaching forever says, the only thing this means is down. It doesn't mean sell. Selling belongs somewhere in here between the 3A2 and 618 Fibonacci retracement. So I have that measured. So there's one, two, three, five minute candles. Turns out there's 30 five minute candles before I actually sell. So I gotta be patient and I gotta be disciplined. Now I'm gonna back out a little bit if I can, will it let me? Okay, I also go an extra step further. So that's just part of the toolkit. The other one is price action. So I see this and then I use the box. Okay, I block the box over into our current reality. You following me? I can only be a bear because of the direction. And now as a bear, I want to sell high at resistance. I've identified re resistance with two different measures. Okay. Zoom in if it's going to let me. Okay. Now, now I've got to figure out where I am. Okay. Do I, is this resistance? No. Is, are we at resistance? No. Are we at resistance? No. Are we at resistance? Maybe. You'd have to be pretty aggressive at 3A2, but we could be. Are we at resistance? Definitely getting there. So now RWA. Why? Because we're at that zone. Ready, willing, and able to sell. This is not hindsight because I've been teaching you this every month for 18 years. So you either know it or you don't. Go one more candle. Oop. One more candle. Are we at resistance? Yes. Is it a sell? No. Oh, red candle. It's kind of a reversal pattern. I think you'd call those railroad tracks or some stupid thing. Okay, do you sell? Well, now it's up to you. Okay. Now, I will dive even further into this, and this is going to be a real challenge now to find this. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> this drives Denise mad. Did I miss it? My stop is there. See, I don't even know where I am anymore. Okay, okay, there we go. So let's, okay, okay. Now we're in, we're in the price zone. You see, we're in the price zone. You're ready, willing, and able. When do you pull the trigger? That's what the number one question always is, right? When do you pull the trigger? When do you pull the trigger? When do you pull the trigger? Okay, you see this? I know it's hard to see, and I'll see if I can zoom in later. You see the 5A cross? And I'm short right there. I shorted the one minute 5A cross. Okay, cool. This X is from is the same analysis, but on a higher time frame. So let me get rid of that X and just focus on the smaller X. So on a scale of one to 10, 10 being perfect, one being 
uh, negligent. How would you rate this trade? Okay. You probably can't even see the entry because of this in the way. This is my sell zone plan A. So I'll delete that. So now I can zoom in. See? There's my little X. It just uh, the one minute X doesn't draw well <laughs> on a four hour chart. All right, we got news coming out. PPI. Huh? PPI. What are you going to do? What you going to do? Okay, PPI coming out. Remember, it's a different measure of inflation. You're going to get a different number. It does, but we're ultra sensitive. Okay. So initial jobless claims coming up at PPI 2.1. It's less than expected. Good news, everybody. Good news. Oh, the world is saved. The world ended yesterday, but now it's going to be good today. Yay. Wow, huh? Can you imagine people are trading and investing this way? Core monthly as expected, year over year less than expected, which tells us inflation is going to cool in the future. Month over month headline less than expected, really good news for those that were freaking out. So I might have to remove my hedge today, hedge today. So yeah, it was the end of the world today. Now it now, now everything's good. Panic is over, everybody. <laughs> oh my god, huh? Yeah. Cool. Well, let's zip over to the buck. What do you think? Which one are you going to trade? Have you decided? Are you going to trade Euro dollar? Are you going to trade Kiwi dollar? Are you going to trade uh, USD yen? Which one? How could you make that kind of decision? Which one is the best? Which one is the most reliable? So it came out less than expected, right? In the past, this has created dollar weakness. Now, I would assume that. But I can tell you 71.4% of the time in the past, it created dollar weakness. Okay, it creates both scalps and swing trades. Isn't that interesting? So I, it builds an extra level of confidence for me. I don't know how the, you feel about it, but I would assume based on my trading experience that the dollar would weaken. We call that risk on. Stock market goes up, dollar goes down. Everything's right is right. But I didn't know it had 71% accuracy. That, that opinion, that experience, that bias, I didn't know the bias had were, was true 71% of the time. Let's say 70% of the time. And I didn't know 30% of the time it didn't work out that way. But now I do know. I don't guess. Guessing's for amateurs. Gambling is for de degenerates. So now we know this information and it makes me confident. And I'm like, cool. 
All right, it's quite reliable. It's pretty reliable, more than two-thirds of the time. Almost three-quarters, right? Almost three-quarters. I'm switching out of the watch, by the way. I, I wore it for a day. You got to wear it every so often. Keep it alive. It's more than 100 years old. Isn't that crazy? So I wound it. I've been a wart for a day. I don't want to overwind it, but I do want to. Can you? Let's see if you can hear it ticking. That's cool, right? Could you hear it? Yeah. It's like a 105-year-old Omega. No, that's too bad. But I had it smuggled out of the Ukraine. I saved it from the war. Anyways, I'm going to switch over. Oh, that's too bad you couldn't, though. I'll switch over to a TOG if you, if you, a watch person. All right, ECB wants to go, so let, let's find them. Where is it? I think it's this. Still a bit early. It's still ten minutes. So, anywho, we'll wait on that. Should be interesting to find out if they are going to cut. Yeah, well, but the thing is, Andrew, it it's only showing you the scalp charts from the past. But when you look at the, you know, if, if you zoom out to the zone that shows you um, the time frame, two hours, four hours, 48 hours, 24 hours, that kind of stuff, it'll tell you, like, the chart will say, like, maybe on average... When this event occurs, you can make 25 pips, let's say. But then when you zoom out and you're like, but it tends to continue going for two days. Well, that's a swing trade. It might be worth 150 pips. So you still have to put it into context. Well, that feels good. I haven't worn this watch in uh, six months. Any of you watch people? Are you watch? Watch lovers, you like complications? My life's complicated. <laughs> it was funny, I, I was wearing this watch somewhere and uh, someone came up to me and he's like, dude, I love that watch. I'm like, right on. And he's like, I don't have the gold one. But he's like, let me tell you the story. I bought the stainless steel one. And he's like, I sold my first company. And he said, I was walking down the street. And it just hit me like, oh, my God, I just sold my company. <laughs> right. And he said, uh, he, he, he was just kind of stunned. It just hit him. He's like, he's got like a lot of money in the bank, right? Just 
you go from zero to hero, right? And 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 he turns, and there's a jewelry store, and there's a Tog Heuer, right, case of watches, and he's like, I'm gonna go in and buy one of those. <laughs> And he said, I walked right in right there. It's like even negotiating the deal and spending weeks on the contract and, and then spending you then very often when you sell your company, you have to stick around for some time to train the new management and everything. And he's like, it, you know, it, it was the first time he was just, it just, it just hit him. And then he looked up and there's a tog cure and he's like, I'm going to buy that. He walked in and he bought it. And he's like, it's that watch, but the stainless steel one. And he's like, it's just so killer. I'm like, neat. <laughs> right? But, you know, you feel good. I feel, I always feel good when I, uh, with people's success stories. I'm like, right on, man. That is so cool. Yeah. And that was a while ago. So this, this watch, this gold watch is from uh, year 2000. The other one is from like the 1800s. <clears throat> All right. So, yeah, we'll see what gets going on. ECB, ECB, ECB. We'll see how long the dollar wants to stay weak. See if this is like a, a full recovery. Notice this range that we've had Aussie dollar in going back to January. Do you remember this? Bears sell here. Bulls buy here. Okay. We had a couple of fake outs, but not breakouts. They didn't close above. Do you remember this? Bulls buy here. Bears sell here. Now, we've had some breakouts to the downside, and it hasn't quite worked. So maybe the range is wrong. But, you know, we just bought it back on the bottom of the range. Uh, miss what? Oh, oh, the, uh, you want, which watch? I had the Omega and then this is the Tog. Which watch do you want to see? They're, they're old. One's 25 and one's 100. We're just waiting for the ECB, so I don't mind. About four minutes now to the ECB. Okay. I'm going to get rid of this because there's no trend. Okay. It was a measure of if we're going to break out, how would it do it? Oops. But we did not break out. So we're going to stay in, in this range forever. There we go. Okay. Okay. I could even clean this up. I'll just remove some of this. Remove some of that. <laughs> okay. I thought it would break. That's This is a failed trade plan, but it is logical. Uh, oh, you mean the one of uh, how to stay in the trade? Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I just, yeah. The answer is yes. Is it going to be today? Uh, I'm doing sort of a planning retreat with myself. So, um, look, I could, but I need to not. There's Sometimes you just have to not do the tactics and you just have to do the strategy. And I mean on the business side, right? Where there's always fires to put out, but at some point you're like, no, I need to, right? I need some time to do the harder stuff. So anyways, I'm going to try. Yeah. Okay, pound dollar and all that kind of stuff. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm very indifferent. In particular, I want to see the market open here first. Like, I don't see conservative trading plans and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm more of like, I'm in the business of sitting and waiting, really. I see this, but, you know, there's a very logical reaction to yesterday's CPI headline. And now it's all gone because of a PPI 0.1 differential. Really? And I can tell you that, uh, you know, PPI is simply calculated different than CPI. It's not an issue of basket. It's, it's what goes in the basket and, and, and such. And so just, uh, just the math might make it slightly lower. So, I, you know, I don't know. It feels like um, this isn't going to save us. It's a relief, and I think that's what's happening now. But I do believe we have a persistent problem. Now, we only have about 30 seconds left, but the biggest thing on my mind is that we still have a shortage in this country. We have a shortage of energy. We have a shortage of housing. We have a shortage of qualified, motivated, hardworking employees. All of that's inflationary. Yeah, but we got plenty of guns. Yeah, I'm surprised because uh, I'm buying my first gun and they're cheap. I'm like, dude, how much is that one? How much is that one? Dude, have you ever seen a Desert Eagle? Holy shit. I like them on Call of Duty, but I'm like, then I, I'm like, is that a real, is that a real <laughs> Desert Eagle? And I, uh huh. How much is that? It's like 1500 bucks. You're like, that's. Why do I want a gun? Because I want to shoot things, Elm. Why, why else would you buy a gun? <laughs> you got the <laughs> no conceal for Denise. An XL, no way. Anyway, so like, dude, like 500 bucks buys you anything you want within reason. Like that is, right? But I'm not even American, Elm. Oh, Kashmina wants the old one. Okay, I got, we got to go because the ECB is starting. Uh, but very often it's just the intro. All right, I'll show you. Wait, where's my streaming software to change the view? I've lost my streaming software. Where's the actual thing? Uh, oh, it's way over there. All right, yeah, I can, and then we'll go. Um, full webcam. Yeah, look at this. This is beautiful. Uh, it's in Tiffany blue. Will it focus? But look at the etching. Ah, come on. It just won't focus, huh? It's all hand etched. Oh, why, why, maybe if I turn the light off. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? Huh? It's cool, right? Yeah, Tiffany Blue. I saved it from the uh, Ukrainian war. No joke. It took three weeks to smuggle it out of the Ukraine. Just to get it out of the country. So I saved it. Oh. All right. So now we got to go to the ECB. Let's bring that up. Uh, where did it go? Oh, 
they're late. Let me refresh my page. Maybe it's an uh, old iteration. In a timely manner. There we go. We oh, the key same color as my watch. Interest rates are at levels that are making a substantial contribution to the ongoing disinflation process. Our future decisions will ensure that our policy rates will stay sufficiently restrictive for as long as necessary. If our updated assessment of the inflation outlook, the dynamics of underlying inflation, and the strength of monetary policy transmission were to further increase our confidence that inflation is converting to our target in a sustained manner, it would be appropriate to reduce the current level of monetary policy restriction. In any event, we will continue to follow a data-dependent and meeting-by-meeting -meeting approach to determining the appropriate level and duration of restriction. And we are not pre-committing to a particular rate path. The decisions taken today are set out in a press release available on our website. And I will now outline in more detail how we see the economy and inflation developing, and will then explain how assessment of financial and monetary conditions. The economy remained weak in the first quarter. While spending on services is resilient, manufacturing firms are facing weak demand, and production is still subdued, especially in energy-intensive sectors. Surveys point to a gradual recovery over the course of this year, led by services. This recovery is expected to be supported by rising real incomes, is it resulting from lower inflation, increased wages, and improved terms of trade. All right, I can fix this. ...of euro area exports should pick up over the coming quarters as the global economy recovers. Hang on, I can fix the echo. Uh, oh, I got to find the software again. Hang on. There it is. I can add. All right, that'll do it. Revised economic governance framework fully and without delay will help governments bring down budget deficits and debt ratios on a sustained basis. It's only doing the sound, but not the video. National, fiscal, and structural policies should be aimed at making the economy more. Help to reduce price pressures in the medium term. Strange, it's not actually at pulling the, the video. Level, an effective and speedy implementation of next generation EU, generation EU program and a strengthening of the single market would help foster innovation and increase investment in the green and digital transition. I'm going to delete it again. Delete More it and do it again. It's not pulling the video. from an annual rate of 2.4% to 2 in month. It's weird. It just won't Food. pull the video. Food price inflation dropped to 2.7% in March from 3.9% in February, while energy price inflation stood at minus 1.8% in March after minus 3.7% in the previous month. Goods price inflation fell again in March to 1.1% from 1.6% in February. However, services price inflation remained high in March 
at 4%. Most measures of underlying inflation fell further in February, confirming the picture of gradually diminishing price pressures. While domestic inflation remains high, wages and unit profits grew less strongly than anticipated in the last quarter of 2023. But unit labor costs remained high, in part reflecting productivity growth. More recent indicators point to further moderation in wage growth. Inflation is expected to fluctuate around current levels in the coming months and to then decline to our target next year, owing to weaker growth in labor costs, the unfolding effects of our restrictive monetary policy and the fading impact of the energy crisis and the pandemic. Measures of longer term inflation expectations remain broadly stable with most standing around 2%. The risks to economic growth remain tilted to the downside. Growth could be lower if the effects of monetary policy turn out stronger than expected. A weaker world economy or a further slowdown in global trade would also weigh on euro area growth. Russia's unjustified war against Ukraine and the tragic conflict in the Middle East are major sources of geopolitical risk. This may result in firms and households becoming less confident about the future and global trade being disrupted. Growth could be higher if inflation comes down more quickly than expected and rising real incomes mean that spending increases by more than anticipated or if the world economy grows more strongly than expected. Upside risks to inflation include the heightened geopolitical tensions, especially in the Middle East, which could push energy prices and... Inflation could also turn out higher than anticipated if wages increase by, increase by more than expected or profit margins prove more resilient. By contrast, inflation may surprise on the downside if monetary policy dampens demand more than expected, or if the economic, the economic environment in the rest of the world worsens more than, expect, more than expected. Market interest rates have been broadly stable since our March meeting, and wider financing condition remain restrictive. The average interest rate on business loans edged down to 5.5%. There we go. Yeah, the edge down in February to 5.1%, coming from 5.2% in January. Mortgage rates were 3.8% in February, down from 3.9% in January. Still elevated borrowing rates and associated cutbacks in investment plans led firms to reduce their demand for loans in the first quarter of 24 as reported in our latest bank lending survey. Credit standards for loans remained tight, with a further slight tightening for lending to firms and a moderate easing for mortgages. Against this background, credit dynamics remain weak. Bank lending to firms grew marginally faster in February at an annual rate of 0.4%, up from 0.2% in January. Growth in loans to households remained unchanged in February at 0.3% on an annual basis. Broad money as measured by M3 grew at a subdued rate of 0.4% in February. So in conclusion, the governing council today decided to keep the three key ECB interest rates unchanged we are determined to ensure that inflation returns to our 2% medium-term target in a timely manner. We consider that the key ECB interest rates are at levels that are making a substantial contribution to the ongoing disinflation process. 
our future decisions will ensure that our policy rate will stay sufficiently restrictive for as long as necessary. If our updated assessment of the inflation outlook, the dynamics of underlying inflation, and the strength of monetary policy transmission were to further increase our confidence that inflation is converging to our target in a sustained manner, it would be appropriate. Current level of monetary policy restriction. In any event, we, can, we will continue to follow a data-dependent and meeting-by-meeting -meeting approach to determining the appropriate level of and duration of restriction, and we are not pre-committing to a particular rate path. In any case, we stand ready to adjust all of our instruments within our mandate to ensure that inflation returns to our medium-term target and to preserve the smooth functioning of monetary policy transmission. We are now ready to take your questions. Thank you, President Lagarde. And uh, the first question goes to Jana Rando of uh, Bloomberg. Jana, please. Where's Michael McKee? Thank you very much for taking my question. Here. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I heard you loud and clear uh, on uh, the uh, confidence uh, needing to increase for restrictions. I guess because it's ECB. Moved. And I also um, heard you saying that um, you're not pre-committed uh, to a specific policy path. Um, I was trying to read as clearly as possible. There you go. Uh, message received. But I, uh, I do... Uh, uh, want to ask you whether you believe uh, that such levels of confidence that you talk about can be reached by the time you next gather to set policy in June. And um, as a side note to that, I would be interested in knowing whether uh, there were some colleagues uh, around the table today that thought uh, time might have already come today. And uh, the second question, and um, I, um, I know that you are going to say we set policy for the eurozone and i uh, appreciate that but i'm wondering um whether a surprisingly hot inflation data out of the us uh, and the reactions is it's uh, it triggered over the past hours or 24 hours or so uh, have changed in any way the way you think about the ecb's policy path going forward thank you not a bad question well, thank you so much. And, you know, you are the first question, but you seem to be covering quite a bit of ground that maybe others wanted to cover as well. Ooh. I'll, I'll try to respond briefly to give others a chance as well to ask similar questions. Oh. You heard me loud and clear indicate in that new sentence, which is prominent in our monetary policy statement, that, and I'll read again, if our updated assessment of the inflation outlook, the dynamics of underlying inflation and the strength of monetary policy transmission were to further increase our confidence that inflation is converging to our target in a sustained manner, it would be appropriate to reduce the current level of monetary policy restriction. It's an important sentence because it really describes the mechanics and it, 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 you know, it better um, clarifies our reaction function and the process through which uh, we are engaging. And I have said previously that in April we get some information and, and some data, and we looked at all that. But in June, we know that we will get a lot more data and a lot more information. And we will also have a new projection, which will incorporate uh, and be informed by, by all that uh, that will be published before uh, projection is completed. So we are data dependent. We will be looking at all this information, all this data, and the projection results that will be produced by the entire euro system, not just the ECB. And then we will determine whether all of that confirms uh, our hope uh, that inflation returns to target in a sustained manner. And if, as a result, our confidence is sufficiently reinforced. I think that's, that's really the mechanics that we will um, adopt, that we have resolved to adopt, and that we will uh, follow uh, in, the, in the coming meetings. Now, you asked me whether everybody was exactly on the same page. Truth be told, a few members, a few members, uh, felt 
sufficiently confident on the basis of the limited data that we received in April. It was just a few members. And they agreed to rally to the consensus uh, of a very, very large uh, majority of uh, the governors who were comfortable with the need to reinforce confidence uh, when receiving a lot more data in June. The third question, because you, you asked the third question, um, you asked whether the US uh, CPI number uh, received yesterday had any bearing and subsequent market development. I have said in the past that we are data dependent, we are not Fed dependent, that was not the Fed, that was CPI numbers, and obviously anything that happens matters to us and will in due course be embedded in the projection that will be prepared and released in June. And you know, the United States is a very large market, a very sizable economy, a major financial uh, center as well. So all that finds its way into, into our projection. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. The next question for CNBC, Annette Weisbach. Annette, please. Thank you very much. I have a question referring as well to the Fed, because clearly if the Fed doesn't cut, we'll probably see that in our exchange rate, the euro exchange rate to the dollar. So how much is that of a concern to you that the euro exchange rate could actually fall to parity or below? And what does it mean for inflation? And then did you discuss shrinking the balance sheet a little bit faster than we are than, than currently planned? Because clearly that's also a policy tool. Thank you. You know, on, on, first of all, I would not speculate what other central banks are or are not going to do. Um, and I think that, as I just responded to the previous questions, consequences in terms of impact on price stability, impact on inflation, whether it is imported inflation or otherwise, all that, of, of course, needs to be taken into account and is monitored very carefully and finds its way into our projection. So all of that will be included, embedded, monitored, and taken into account in, in our projection. But you know, we don't, we don't target exchange rate, we don't comment on exchange rate, and I'm not going to go any further than that. I would simply mention that uh, you know, it, there are multiple channels through which multiple. Uh, can be exercised. It's not just through exchange rates. I think there are other, other channels. Um, the size of our balance sheet uh, has quite significantly reduced uh, already, and uh, you, 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 I'm sure you have. This is quantitative that, tightening. The the entire very large uh, Teltro reimbursement that was that was coming during March has been entirely reimbursed, of course, and additional uh, over 30 billion uh, euros has also been added to the reimbursement. In addition to that, given the uh, APP uh, gradual runoff, we also reduce our balance sheet by an average of about $30 billion per month. And that process is ongoing and will continue to, uh, to happen as, uh, as anticipated, as predicted, and as determined by the maturity of, uh, of those uh, bonds that come to runoff. And then we will move to the reduction of the PEP reinvestment until um, from the 1st of July until the end of December, and then that, that's, that's the plan. But there is no further discussion on that. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question for Francesco Canepa of Reuters. Francesco, please. So um, inflation was um, on the way up in 2021, 2022, a global phenomenon, or so it turned out, even though initially you guys were not expecting it to spread to the eurozone so much. You guys, you refer to the governing council? Yeah, the ECB, the projections. The yeah, you guys, come on, dude. To be high in the eurozone as, uh, as it was in the US. So uh, what makes you think that this time around it will be different and the eurozone can diverge from the US um, and with where inflation rates are kind of refusing to fall further? Mm. Well, that's the second question, if I may, then. Is your confidence about the condition being met in June um, lower than it was, for example, a month ago, as you were speaking at the ECB watchers, or is it, or is it intact? Well, 
Thank you for picking up on the watcher's speech. I think that's the one that you're referring to, in which I tried to describe um, as, as accurately as possible the sequences that we went through. The hiking cycle, the holding cycle, and the prospect of the dining down cycle. And I think that most, if not all, that I have said in that uh, speech uh, still holds to this day. And I, I describe, I think, in very specific terms what the confidence level should be and on what basis we're going to nurture that confidence and, and, uh, and reinforce it over the course of time in that process. So By the way, how do you like the sonar? Whether I'm more or less confident, I think that is it helpful? What we're saying in the MPS today is that if, and I'm, I'm not going to... Remember, we knew this before the news came out. Uh, you just didn't know what the news would be, but then you knew what it would be and you already had this information. ...would further increase our confidence that inflation is uh, sustainably at 2% as we anticipate, then it would be appropriate. So that, that, is, that, is, that stands very much and it's completely the continuation of the Watcher's speech that I gave about 10 days ago. So you asked me about... Um, the distinction that we should or that we should not draw between euro area inflation and US inflation. And why would not would we not be entirely uh, US inflation dependent in, in a way or US, US CPI dependent? It should, it's should, a good should question. Take our cue from that. You know, we are operating in the euro area with the euro area economy for the benefit of the European. All right, she's going to give you our the obvious answer. Price stability. And we have to determine our, our monetary policy uh, decisions on the basis of the data that are produced by the euro area, on the basis of the global environment, and that includes obviously the United States, but it also includes China, which matters. It also includes Japan, which matters, and a lot of emerging market economies that also have a bearing. But we focus predominantly on the territory for which we have responsibility for monetary policy. As you know, and as I'm sure all of you in the room know, the nature of inflation in the euro area was different from the nature of inflation in the United States, notably. The drivers of it were different, the fiscal response was different, the consumption um, uh, by, by US consumers is of a different nature, investments were different. So I don't think that we can, you know, draw conclusions uh, on, uh, you know, based on, on an assumption that the two inflations are the same. They are not the same. The two economies are not the same. The political regimes are not the same. The fiscal policies are different. And as a result of that, we have to focus on what we have jurisdiction for, which is the euro area taking into account what happens in the rest of the world, but not assuming that what happens in the euro area will be the mirror of what happens in the United States, because we are looking at two different things. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Martin Arnold from the Financial Times. Martin. Hello, President Lagarde. Two questions for you. Uh, first, to return to the theme of uh, transatlantic divergence. Uh, if this divergence on monetary policy uh, that is expected uh, materializes, does that mean that the ECB is likely to have to ease policy more because of a spillover from US, uh, tighter financial conditions from the US? Or does it mean that you're likely to do less because of foreign exchange markets potentially putting upward pressure on inflation in the euro area. Second question is on energy markets. We've seen a roughly 10% increase in oil prices in recent weeks. How big a concern for you is that? Um, and could that derail uh, the potential rate cut in June? Thank you. Thank you very much for the for your two questions. And in, in many ways, you've you've answered the first question, or you at least gave me the elements of my answer to your questions. We are data dependent. We will operate meeting by meeting. 
and we will take into account all the data that actually matter and how they unfold and develop and affect our economy. As a result of that, I cannot pre-commit to any route for easing more, easing less, unless and until we have the data and we can analyze the data. So that, that will uh, take its course uh, as... Uh, now we just hit the central pivot. The events unfold, and as I said, I'm not going to speculate... Shields up, red alert. ...and decisions of another central bank. Thank you for your second question on the energy market. There is one uh, particular segment in the monetary policy statement that I, I wouldn't want to let um, go unnoticed because I think it, it's important, particularly in, in relation to uh, energy prices. And that's the, the portion that relates to inflation. And I'll read it again for you. Inflation is expected to fluctuate... Fluctuate! I like that. Months and to then decline to our target next year, owing to weaker growth in labor costs, the unfolding effect of our restrictive monetary policy, and the fading impact of the, the energy crisis and the pandemic. A lot of that, those fluctuations that we refer to in that particular paragraph will actually be associated with the very low energy costs that we had in two episodes over the course of 23. And obviously, the price of energy, as we see it unfolding in the weeks and months to come, will have a bearing related to that base to which prices are compared. So inflation decline, which we have observed so far, are not going to be linear and we will have fluctuation around current level based on our projections until it declines to our target in mid-2025. And energy prices obviously will matter in that respect. Thank you, President Lagarde. The next question goes to Isabella Bufaki of Phil Solon and Quattro. Isabella, please. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I have one question about the ECB uh, not pre-committing to a particular rate path, but could we still count on uh, a path of seasons? For example, <laughs> uh, going from a restrictive season uh, to what you said in the past could be the uh, gradual normalization process. Yeah, it was and, great, right? Uh, my second question is... TPI, uh, just because maybe uh, there start to be some uh, small tensions in the markets um, as several countries may qualify for excessive deficit procedures. Uh, what is the impact of this event, if any, on the transmission protection instrument eligibility? As the first criteria of this eligibility does mention the excessive deficit procedures. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your two questions. Um, the ECB is a bank of all season. And I don't think that we can be tied to any particular season. Uh, we will be data dependent. And if the data continue to, uh, uh, to move in, in this the direction of the disinflationary path that we see, then progress will be continued as well uh, in the path that we adopt. <laughs> but this is going to be she just won't say cut. And that is the reason why we state very clearly in the monetary policy statement that we are not pre-committing to a particular rate path. But like the Fed is what she's saying. Is rather clear, but there is no pre-commitment. She's pre saying that Jay Powell has made a mistake talking about three cuts, three cuts, three cuts. Remember, they don't even give forward guidance at the ECB. On your TPI question, there is a very clear press release that we have posted and that stands, which I'm not going to comment upon yet again. 
But the excessive deficit ah, procedure sorry. is one of the components, of the four components, that we assess when we determine eligibility. And it's an alternative condition that is indicated in that particular segment, which is taken into account, will be taken into account by the governing council. So I think you have the answer right there. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. Um, the next question goes uh, to an online participant, and it's uh, Philippe, Jean-Philippe Lacour of Agence France Press. Uh, Jean-Philippe, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. This oh, time, perfect. Yes. Fantastic. Um, I have only one question because all the other ones were already asked, and um, it refers on budgetary policies. Um, as you know, Germany is already pursuing a restrictive uh, budgetary policy, and Italy and for sure France will Italy. Also have to do, uh, given their public deficits larger than expected. So, would uh, it's a little uh, different question than the, the previous one, but would this situation of restrictive policy uh, offer a reason for the ECB to maybe accelerate future rate cuts? E this is my question. Well, thank you so much for your, for your question. And on, on fiscal affairs, I'm going to uh, limit myself to the comments that we included in the monetary policy statement, where we uh, indicate... Hope you guys are having a good time. ...that government should continue to roll back energy-related support measures so that disinflation can proceed sustainably. And of course... We then say that implementing the EU's revised economic governance framework fully and without delay will help government bring down budget deficit and debt ratio on a sustained basis. We had the privilege of uh, Valdis Dombrovsky being with us uh, during the, uh, the, the governing council meeting this morning. And uh, I think all governors were very pleased to hear him confirm that the uh, revised economic governance framework will be put to a vote to the European Parliament before uh, the end of their session, which I think has another two weeks to go. So this, this is uh, good news uh, to the extent that there will be a framework within which governments are expected to operate and which will be um, guiding principles and helpful from our monetary policy standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question goes to Carlo Boffa of Politico. Carlo, please. Thank you very much for taking my question. Good afternoon. Um, first question <clears throat> I wanted to ask you is uh, the services inflation is still very uh, sticky. It's flatline for uh, the last five months and the underlying momentum is now accelerating. So would you say that the ECB could theoretically still go ahead with a cut in June if services inflation sticks at around 4%? And my second question uh, is if you can give us a bit of color of the discussion within uh, the governing council around the balance of risk surrounding inflation. Uh, some of your colleagues have suggested that the balance of risk are now more balanced. Uh, where do you stand? Thank you. So thank you for the two questions. On, on your first question, you are right. And I think we point out very clearly in the monetary policy statement that services inflation uh, is still holding uh, at high levels. It has been at 4% for the last five months. Domestic inflation, which comprises a lot of services as well, is uh, at 4.5 and has been there for the last three months, if I recall. And this is a segment, and those are numbers and indicators that we're going to monitor very carefully that we will look at very carefully. The momentum is something that we will be also, also very attentive to. But we are not going to wait until everything goes back to 2% to make the decisions that will be necessary in order to make sure that inflation returns to 2% sustainably um, at target in a timely manner. So it's inevitable that some items will be slightly higher and we know that, for instance, if you look at the, the, uh, the disaggregation of items, goods, for instance, are at, I forgot whether it's 1.7 or 1.1, but it has gone down. It's 1.1, it was 1.6 in February. So it's, it's inevitable that some items and some segments will be at higher levels. And we will look at all of them to make our determination and to decide whether 
on the basis of that assessment, we are confident enough. So that's the first point. Look, on, on the balance of risk, I know one or two governors who are keen on this balance of risk concerning inflation. But we've always tried to stay away from that in relation to inflation, historically. Historically, we have determined whether it was to the upside, to the downside, or... Inevitable! <laughs> right, Alejandro. Activity, not in relation to inflation. And what we prefer to do, as a matter of principle, is identify those components that will be bringing an upside to the risk and those that will bring a downside to the risk. That's what we have done repeatedly in the monetary policy statement. We do that yet again. And, you know, when you look at the level of uncertainty around, it's probably the, the right approach to do so in relation to inflation. Thank you, President. And the next question goes to Stefan Rechius of Handelsblatt. Stefan, please. Thank you for the floor. Uh, one question is a follow-up on the oil prices. Um, how much of an uh, upward uh, um, uh, concern is that when it comes to inflation going forward? Uh, and my second question is on the BLS, the bank lending server that you mentioned. What is your main takeaway from that? Uh, is it uh, that um, the, uh, there is less demand by companies or is it uh, more that uh, mortgages and, and consumer credit has picked up a bit? Thanks. Well, thank you very much for your, for your two questions. On the, uh, on the oil prices, it has increased, uh, as, as was said by one of your colleagues, by 10% in the most uh, recent uh, weeks. And it's obviously an item which matters a lot. Uh, we have learned um, from the recent uh, shocks that energy costs uh, uh, play a significant role and uh, we, we are very attentive to those evolutions. We are largely informing our uh, assessment on the basis of futures. So we look at how futures evolve as well. It's not just the, uh, the price of the, of the barrel of Brent uh, that we look at. We also anticipate, um, try to anticipate as, as well as is possible and it's not perfect, but we try to use futures as, a, as a, an indicator of where the markets are seeing prices of oil for the future. Um, thank you for your second question, because it's, it, the, the bank lending survey is always informative, but it's a survey. And it indicates what the banks assess, assume, expect from their customers, both the corporate customers and the households, the people. Predominantly mortgage and, and, not, and a bit on consumption, but predominantly mortgage. So we have that. And we also have the hard data, which is interest rates that are offered uh, to those customers. And you have the volume of, of loans uh, on, on an annual basis. So if you, if you only uh, look at the bank lending survey, what you see is the anticipation by the banks that demand will be slightly lower, both on the corporate and the, on, on the household um, side. If you look at volume, there is a slight, not a major, but a slight uptick in the volume of loans uh, to corporates and a slight stable compared with the last month uh, uptick in the volume of loans offered to households. And final point, on both corporate loans and loans to households, we have a slight decline in the interest rate that is offered to the borrowers. So you can tell, you can deduct from that, that the financial sector is expecting that financing costs are likely to be smaller in the future. It's the beginning. And in, in, in many of those numbers, data indicators, indicators that we have, we see positive development, but it's the beginning of developments. And uh, we, as I said earlier, to, in response to the first question, we want to reinforce that confidence that uh, things are going in the right direction, both in terms of growth, but more importantly, in terms of inflation decline. Thank you very much.
Madame Lagarde. And the last question of the day goes to Andres Stumpf uh, of Expansion. Andres, please. Thank you. I would like to know what, what fluctuations on the current, current inflation number could be tolerated if they come from uh, supply shocks and not from, from the era robust demand. And maybe going uh, again above uh, 3%. I mean, I mean this because, as you have just mentioned, uh, last inflation spike started as a supply shock. And a uh, second question, uh, public debt threats are as tight as I can remember. Are you glad that you could deliver your restrictive monetary policy without crea creating big tensions, or do you fear that this will incentivize uh, deficits? Thank you. So on, on, on your first question, we know that there will be fluctuation. That's the reason why we put it in the monetary policy uh, statement. We know that we're not going to be a linear decline on inflation over the course of the next month's quarter. But what our projections are telling us is that we will have those bumps on the road, if you will, but with reaching the target in mid-25. So return to 2% in mid-25. Between now and 25, there will be ups, there will be downs, there will be ups. And as I said, a lot of that is related to the base effects that result from the two uh, significant change in energy prices in the course of 23. How much can we tolerate? I think what is really important is the data. It's the overall data. It's the projection. We you know, have embedded in our projection of last March, those bumps on the road. It is in there, it's in the baseline. What we need to see is how much away from those bumps in, embedded in the baseline we are likely to go if we are facing supply shock, uh, as, as, as you suggested. But bumps will be there, it will not be linear. Bumps are embedded in the, in the, in the projection of March. We will you know, take uh, stock of that in June as well and update our projection um, at that point in time. You're on your, look, on your second question, and given that you are the last question, uh, and without being triumphant and without um, celebrating anything yet, but what we are observing, and what we are observing is a decline of inflation, a disinflationary process that is uh, in progress, uh, that is um, comforting us that the monetary policy that we have adopted so far has contributed significantly to this, and that we will continue to operate on the basis of the three criteria um, that I have mentioned now several times, which are in the monetary policy statement being particularly attentive to wages and the evolution of wages, which constitute a large contributor to services, close attention to profits, to make sure that unit profits actually um, absorb as much as possible the wage increases that will inevitably happen. And we will also continue to be very attentive to productivity, which is also uh, something that we expect will improve in the course of uh, 24. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings the press conference to an end. Uh, the next press no! conference is on the 6th of June. Up until then, all the best. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I guess that's it. What a wonderful day. Hey, if you're a member of the Swing Trading Group, or day trading group at investorbootcamp.com. We are meeting today at 4 p.m. for a couple of hours. Try to plan out all of next week. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah. Cool. Well, there you go. So, peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. Have a wonderful trading day. I'll see you when I see you. Peace.